We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Apostle Paul, in his letters to the church, his last words were, his last words were, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and what's the next line? The love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, right? Meaning that the Lord Jesus Christ is the personality of grace. He is characterized by grace, and we thought about that line last week. So today I want to talk about the love of God, because scripture says that God is love. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that God is love? Scripture actually says that God is love. You don't understand what I'm saying. It didn't say that God has love. He didn't say that God shows love. The word says that God is love. It tells you the character of God. And the character of God can be seen in scriptures. God does not have a mood swing. God is a God of integrity. Meaning you can always expect him to show same character all age long. And the character of God we see in scripture is that God is what, talk to me, love. And today I just want to talk a little bit about what I call love letters. The love of God expressed to man and how God showed man his love. I would be in the book of John. John the apostle, all right, historians tell us, was the youngest of all the apostles. He was the closest disciple to Jesus. No one knew about the love of God other than John. It was John that wrote, for God so loved the world. John is the guy who always refers to himself as the disciple whom the Lord loves. And so he gave himself a nickname, John the Beloved. He understood the love of Christ Jesus. He always leaned on Jesus' chest. And, and his writings are so much in sync. Whether you read the book of John in the Gospels, or you read 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John when he has gotten a bit older, you will see the same concept that he gives to us all through his writing. Let's start from 1st John chapter 3 and verse 1. I will just go to the next chapter after that. 1st John chapter 3. When he was a younger man, he wrote, For God so loved the world. Now, older, he still expresses the same thoughts. Beloved, what manner of love? You know, that word manner means you can't begin to explain it. We've not seen this type before. What manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the world? Now, I want you to understand that when you talk about God being loved now, you are not talking about emotional love. When you talk about God as love, how is the love of God expressed? How, how do you know that God is love? It is answering the question, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Oh, are you in church this morning? It's a little bit cold. Are you in church this morning? Now, we are saying that God's love for you is only proven by one thing, the fact that he made you his son. God's love for you is not that you got married or you, you have everything good in life. God's love for you is that he chose to make you his own. Let's make that clearer. Go to the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 9. Please be fast. In this was manifested the love of God towards us. Because that God sends his only begotten son into the world, 
that me and you might live through him. How do you know that God loves you? Okay, wait a minute. Let me ask you, does God love you? How do you know? Because somebody will think God loves me. That's why I woke up this morning. That is true, but that is not the truth. Because some people have passed on. And I can tell you that God doesn't love them less. You say, ah, God loves me. That's why I am, I am walking on my two feet. That is true, but that is not all of the truth. Because some people are on wheelchair and God still loves them. There is only one proof to show that God loves us. God does not need to give you a fine house and a car to show that he loves you. The only way by which God proved his love to humanity is that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me and you. Scripture says that in this was the love of God manifest, manifested. That was how he showed his love in tangible form. That Jesus Christ died for you. Whether you are rich or you are poor, that is not the basis upon which we explain the love of God. Whether you feel sick or you are healthy, that is not the basis upon which we explain the love of God. Whether you have all you want in life or you are still in pursuit as all of us young people, that is not the basis of explaining the love of God. How do you know that God loves you? Upon which platform, on which basis, against which backdrop is the love of God manifested? It is the fact that Christ died. So the next time you feel that you know what, I don't even think God loves me. Look at me, I've not eaten since yesterday. Realize that you are weighing God's love on lower parameters. When you should be thinking that, you know, I'm not even sure God loves me. Look at the cross. And picture the guy that hung on the cross. That is all of love as it can be defined. Let's add the writings of Paul to this. Take me to Romans 5, verse 8. Romans 5, verse 8. But God commended his love towards us. This is how God showed us his love. Not by giving us Valentine gifts, all of the mushy things we like as people. God commended his love towards us. In that why we are yet sinners. Come on, talk to me. Christ died for us. Can you imagine? It would have made more sense if he died for his friends. Christ died for his enemies. Let's read this from context. Start from verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Remember, Christ is our hope. Because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. And by the way, if you are born again, you are a Christian, you have the capacity to love. You might not love 100% as God loves, but you can always be growing in your love work. Because it says that the Holy Spirit is shed abroad in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the means in which God has shed his love abroad in our hearts. He says, hope make it not ashamed. Why? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Go ahead. Six. For when we are yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Meaning when we are yet sinners. Can you see how the sin makes us weak? When we were yet without strength, that's the word used there. Christ died for us. Died for the ungodly. We didn't know God. Seven. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. It's difficult. Per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now it takes us back to it. But God... You see, when you see a but, it means that the conversation is about to change. 
So, so this one is not normal. For a good man, it's cast for somebody to die. But God commended his love towards us. God showed us his love in that why we were yet sinners, why we were yet as bad as we were, Christ did what? Died for us. Now, let me ask you again. Does God love you? How do you know? Oh, you have not believed yet. Have you gotten the point yet? Does God love you? How do you know God loves you? Christ died for you. This is how to measure it. If not, every day you will have needs. The day he doesn't meet the need for that day, you will say, no, he doesn't love me. You will forget he met the need for yesterday. God loves you in that Christ did what talk to me, died for you. You cannot outlove God. First John 4 verse 10. You cannot love him more than he can love you. Hearing is love. So this is how love is, real love now. Not that we love God, but that he did what? Loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. Same conversation. Jump to verse 19. We love him. Talk to me. Why? Because he first loved us. How do we know he first loved us? His son died for us. Are you getting the teaching now? See, we love him because that means you can only respond to his love for you. That means you cannot start boasting about how much you love him. You should only worship him for how much he loves you. Are you seeing? You don't come into his presence singing, I love him forever. You might not really know what you are saying. You come singing about what? How he loves you forever because you are not the standard. Our love today, we fall in love. Tomorrow, we fall out of love. But God loved us first even when we did not appreciate the love. You can only respond to the love of God. And, 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 and there are two major ways to respond to the love of God. By loving your neighbor and by reaching out to souls. Show me the next verse, 20. Verse 20, next verse. If a man say, I love God, and then hates his brother, that man is a what? You know, these scriptures are so clear. If we just read just these scriptures today, I think the point is clear. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, physically now, how can he love God, whom he hath not what? Seen. Meaning, if you want to say you love God, you are going too far. Love your neighbor. Are you saying? The only measurement to show that you love God, if we need to qualify or quantify your love for God, is that we will check how you love the next image of God by your side. Are you seeing? And, 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 and see, it says you can't say you love God and hate your brother. Hate is devilish, show. I don't have to like you, but I should love you. Meaning, I might not be so cool with you. I might be putting up one or two attitudes. But if you were to trip from this place, and I am standing close, I should give you a hand. You understand? So, so love is a commandment. It is not choosy. They are, we are not saying have the person in your space, but you must show love. Praise God. In 1 John chapter 3, 11, good. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Okay, I like that. 12. 
not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Now the big one. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Death. So we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. If I don't love, I'm still in death. So a hatred is death. 15. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And that was the issue of Cain he was talking about. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Wow. So clear. So you can't be a killer and say you have eternal life, you are born again. And, and that was who Cain was. You see, I like, go back to verse 12. I like the fact that he called Cain wicked and he quantified why he called him wicked. Because not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Why did he call Cain wicked? Because Cain slew his brother. You must separate wickedness from weakness. Some people are weak, so they have tantrums every now and then. But some others are wicked. You manage weakness, you avoid wickedness. Your own responsibility is to love. It did not give you the distance. Are you seeing? So you can love in proximity. You can love from a distance. Now show me verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. This is how we know God's love. Because he, God, laid down his life for us. And so, and so, we ought to lay down our lives for the world. What that means in tangible forms is that we should make deep sacrifices one for another, lay down our lives for the brethren. So you don't just come to God and start saying, ah, you don't love me. God has nothing to prove. We know his love, how that was he laid down his life for us. God will be telling you, if I have laid down my life for you, I've given you all. Jesus dying on the cross is enough. That is all the proof of love that God can give. God does not have any other means of proving his love. So what you have or what you don't have is not a proof of the love of God. The love of God is only proven by what? The fact that Christ died. And when you believe it that way, what do you do? You love your own brethren. Praise God. You don't let the sun go down on your anger. You don't become a petty person. Apart from loving people, if you also want to respond to the love of God, the other way is that you reach out to souls. That was what happened in John 21. Okay? John 21, Jesus asked Peter, was that Peter from verse 15, I think, Simon, lovest thou me more than this? Jesus was the one asking him now. All right? Lovest thou me more than this? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said unto him, feed my lamb. I like this statement of Jesus. If you read down, he asked him three times, Simon Peter, do you love me more than this? Jesus was telling him, there is a possibility that you can love me more than you love me now. You know what that means? It means that love is in degrees. Are you here? Lovest thou me more than this? Can you do a better job at loving me more than the way you love me right now? I know you love me, but can you love me even better? Can you love me some more? Because love is in degrees. Love is in levels. And Peter, all right, was saying, you know I love you. You don't just tell God you know I love you. It is seen in action. And Jesus told him, feed my lamb. 
The next time he told him, feed my sheep. The next time again, feed my sheep. Meaning that when you love God, you will reach out to somebody else. When you love God, you, you, you don't contain the love in you. you. The love will flow out of you to the next person. See, and I have seen this in Christendom. You don't know a mature Christian by the gifts of the Spirit. That I speak in tongues and interpret tongues or give prophecies or work miracles. That is not the height of knowing someone who has depth in spirituality. It is not by the gifts of the Spirit you will know by the word fruit of the Spirit. And it is written, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Galatians 5.22. You know Jesus actually said, by their fruit you shall know them. Oh, talk to me. People can fake the gifts. They cannot fake the fruits. You can fake tongues. You can fake prophecy. You can fake working of miracles. You can fake all of the gifts of the Spirit. But you cannot fake the fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. And this was not bad English. He mentioned nine things, but he didn't say the fruits of the Spirit are. He didn't make the fruits plural. It was singular. But the fruit of the Spirit is. So there is just one fruit. And what is that one fruit? Love. Every other thing becomes a subset of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, the rest of them, meekness. Against such there is no law. This was what he was saying in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, when he was giving the characteristics of love. Let's start from verse 1. Now, that's a love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, from verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, you see now, tongues, and I have not love, I have not charity, I am just like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, meaning I'm an empty barrel that makes much noise. And people go with the noise and the tongues, but God is looking at the love. Verse 2. And though I have the gifts, are you seeing? Gifts now, of prophecy, understand mysteries, I have word of knowledge, I have the gift of faith, I can even move mountains, but if I have charity, I am nothing, because it is love that gives you worth. Three, and though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be born, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Can you see that people can even be philanthropic and yet be loveless? So philanthropy is not a proof that your heart is lovely. Giving people gifts or, you know, and using cameras to show on the media how that you are helping the community, it does not mean you have love at your heart. It says, and I even give my body to be born. That means you are dying. So you can even die but not die for love. Oh, you didn't get that. Go to verse 4, please. Now, now, he's talking about the characteristics of love now. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Is that not what he was saying in Galatians 5.22? The fruit of the Spirit is love. He now began to add joy, peace, goodness. That's what he's telling you now. Love, long suffering. Love suffers long. Kindness, love is kind. Love does not envy itself. Love does not vaunt itself. Love is not puffed up. Continue. Love does not behave itself unseemingly. You know, when you understand the characteristics of the love of God, you will weigh your own love. And be sure what you even call love is actually, actually love. Love seeketh not her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Are you seeing? Verse 6. Rejoice not in iniquity, but love rejoice in what? In the truth. 
if you actually have an encounter with God, when you meet God, when you become born again, you will be loving, you will be lovely, you will be lovable. The, the, the mark or the sign that someone has been with God is the measure of love in the heart of that person. And that love can be explained with all of these characteristics. Now, that is the love of God. And that is what we copy after. Because whatever God does is out of love. Even when God weeps, somebody is out of love. And so, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Praise God. Let me just quickly talk about five or six facts about the love of God. And we will just, all right, use that to round this off. And I'd like you to use this fact as a scale to weigh your own love. And be sure if what you call love is actually love. Number one, God's love is everlasting. Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I have loved you with some words, everlasting love. God's love is everlasting. With loving kindness have I drawn you. God's love is not, you know, today you are in love, tomorrow you are out of love. No. God does not have a mood swing. God's love stands the test of time. God does not fall out of love every now and then. When God says, I love you, he loves you. And that love is forever. See, your last breath, with that love, he's still beckoning on you. Number two, God loves us equally, but differently. God loves us equally, but differently. Can I surprise you? God loves you exactly the same way he loves Jesus. God does not love his son more than you. Because now Jesus has become the firstborn of the new creation. And the rest of us are his younger siblings. And God has equal love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world. Wait a minute. Did he say, for God so loved the Christians? Are you here? Did he say, for God so loved only those who go to church? He says, God so loved the world. God, God has equal love for everybody. What separates us as Christians? We are the ones who have responded to the love of God. Are you seeing? And I hope you know that you are in church does not make you a Christian. That you are in church does not mean you are in touch. Not, not every patient in the hospital is responding to treatment. Are you seeing? So, so when I'm talking about Christians now, I'm not talking about just those who are in church on Sunday morning. I'm talking about you know in your heart. Praise God. God loves the world. If God loves the world, what would you do? You also love them. Now, can you think of who is in the world? It's a scary thing to think about. John 3.16 did not say, for God only loves the good people. He said, for God so loved the world. Who is in the world? The person that stole your phone. Meaning, God loves him. Who is in the world? The rapists and the raped. So are you saying that God loves me as much as he loves the person that raped me? Yes. Is that fair? No. But he is God all by himself. If you have two children, if you have two children, and one is good and one is bad, 
and they tell you, choose the one that should be killed. Which one will you choose? If they are both your children. Let's assume one always disturbs you at home, makes you talk, makes you shout, and one is quiet, goes on an errand, and they say, choose one that will die. Who will you choose? You will choose none. But why do Christians want to make God choose one of his children that he will kill? So my mouth has died by fire. Now, you forget that Mama Osas is also God's child as you are. Do you know that something happened in the Bible does not mean it is God's standard? One day, Jesus and his disciples were going somewhere. And some men were laid them. One of his disciples, I'm sure that will be Peter. Peter, forgive me if it's not you. Said... Master, Luke 15, verse 4, or Luke 9, sorry, verse 54. Master, should we call down fire and consume them as Elijah did? Is that it? Yes. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, oh, Peter, no verse. You know, Peter is always the hard one. They said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? See what Jesus replied them. Oh, I like the way Jesus talks. He turned, rebuked them, and said, you know not what manner of spirits you are of. See, the character of God is open for all to see. That Elijah did this in the Old Testament and God indulged him does not mean that was God's best. How do we know Jesus now, the perfect image of God, is now on earth showing you really what God's heartbeat is? And the same scenario is presented and Jesus said, you can't go around burning people. You know not what manner of spirits you are of. But some of us are still saying, if I be a man of God, let fire fall. Fall? If fire should fall, it should fall and revive us as Christians. Not to fall and kill somebody. Why? God loves us equally. Luke 15 verse 4. Jesus is the guy who lives 99 sheep and go to look for one. How important can one be? You have 100. One goes astray. You leave 99 to go and look for one. Is that good investment? No, if you have business sense, won't you rather put that in 99? He leaves 99, so go look for one. But what if me and you were the one? And actually, we were. If he didn't go to look for that one, he won't find you. Because that was how he strayed away. Are you seeing? God loves us equally. For God so loved the world. That word so is an adverb of manner. It expresses the depth of the love God has for mankind. God so loved the world. And in response to that love, he did something he gave. So God loves us equally, but he loves us differently. Because the way you understand love might not be the way another understands love. God will see one person and will hug the person. And will see the next person and will say, you know what, just go ahead with your business. Because he realizes that the one I hug, that's how that one understands love. If you don't get physical, that one thinks you are distant. But somebody else is, all right, knows that it's a thing of the heart. Even when he scolds me, he loves me. So he expresses his love differently. But he loves us all equally. Praise God. Number three, God's love gives endlessly. So if you are in love, ask yourself if you do give. For God so loved the world, he so loved that he so gave. He gave what 
is difficult for any man to give. He gave his only begotten son. As you mean you, had, you, you have many children, it's difficult to give one. God had just one at the time. Painfully so, he didn't give that one to people he loved. It's not like saying, this is my only son, come and die for my wife. He gave his only son to people who didn't care. When you love, you will give. God so loved that God gave endlessly. If I read through my Bible, there is only one man I can see that have come close to this kind of love. His name is Abraham. When you read for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, compare this scripture, John 3, 16, to Genesis 22, verse 2. You will see that Abraham's own drama was looking like a picture of what would come. And God said unto Abraham, Take now thy son. Now look at the next emphasis. Thy only son, Isaac. Is not what he said? For God so loved God that he gave his only begotten son. So Abraham, take now thy only son. Now look at the next line. Whom thou lovest. For God so loved the world, for God so loved, for God so loved that he gave his only. Abraham, you love so much, give your only. God was painting a picture. No wonder Abraham became the father of faith. And today we all claim Abraham's blessings. We are all the seed of Abraham. God told him, take down your only son. So the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering. While he was about to do that, while he was about to do that, God stopped him. God was checking his heart. Will he actually kill his son? Some persons would defraud God. When you go to the mountain, you tell the boy, just run. If you like, come back or we kill you. And then you come back and tell God, I've killed him. Or while I was about to kill him, he beats me up. Abraham was an old man. Isaac, his son, was younger and should be stronger. The boy could have pushed him down and, and said, okay, you, let me sacrifice you today. Let's see, you know. While he was going to do that, God called him, stop. There is a ram in the ticket. Use that word. And that was a picture because God was saying you wouldn't have to kill a man. The man you will kill will be a lamb. Jesus is called the lamb of God. And so God was painting a picture. But only Abraham featured in that script. So Abraham understands the depth of that love. I just want to imagine what Abraham would have told Sarah when he came back home. Honey, welcome back. What about our son? Say he's dead. What happened? I killed him. Why? God said I should kill him. Some wives will poison their husbands. Cry a bit. When you serve him dinner, it will be his turn. The proof of love is sacrificial giving. Are you with me? The proof of love is sacrificial giving. God so loved that God so gave. You that you love, do you give sacrificially? When we say sacrificial giving, it is not, it is not, I have two million and I give 1,000 naira. That's not sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving is, I have 100 naira recharge card on my phone, and I transfer 70 naira. That's sacrificial. So I'm not concerned about quantity. I'm concerned about what it costs you. So the person, that's why Jesus said, this widow has given more than everybody else. It was called the widow's mite. 
People were giving larger sums. But she brought the only thing she has, sacrificial giving. God is not asking you to kill your child today. But when you love him, he, he talks about a sacrifice. He calls the sacrifice of praise. Give me something that costs you something. Don't give me the leftover. If you really love, you want to empty yourself to give for the one you love. So I have said that God's love is everlasting. That God loves us equally but differently. And that God's love gives what? Endlessly. You know, until you make, and let me say this to people who are in love, you are not sure you love yet until a sacrifice is involved. That's God's pattern. You are not sure you love yet. You can be saying you are in love now, but what happens if, God forbid, the person you love has an accident and is now confined to a wheelchair? Will you still love as much and dance freely on your wedding day? Sacrifice is what tests love. You love now. What happens when the person suddenly realizes that, you know what, I never knew I'm HIV positive. Would you still love? Some have already given up. Say, not be me, you go kick. But you know I'm speaking to people here. Love will be seen in the sacrifice made. And that is where real relationship begins. When you and the person you claim to love, now together as a team, start fighting to maintain that level of sacrifice. That is where you start communicating from the heart. But up until that point, you are just impressing each other. Oh, today you buy ice cream. Tomorrow you buy shawarma. You, 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 you are practicing. You have not started. Number four. God's love will conquer challenges. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Because everything he listed will come in form of people. Who, not what, shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now he begins to list them. Shall tribulation? Now don't reply because until you've experienced it. Shall distress? Persecution? How about famine? So that I've not eaten since yesterday, does it mean God does not love me? Now, unfortunately, all of these are the parameters that people are using to weigh God's love, to say either God loves us or does not love us because I've not eaten since so God doesn't love me. Shall nakedness, so that you don't have clothes to wear, does it mean God does not love you enough? So he's listing very mundane things or peril. Or even sword that you had to die doesn't mean he doesn't love you. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. 37. But nay, in all these things we are more than what? Now, in all which things? Persecution. Tribulation. Farming, nakedness, peril, sword. So before you start shouting, I'm more than a conqueror, have you gone through persecution? Have you gone through tribulation? Have you gone through the sword? Have you been in farming? Have you been naked? 38. For I am persuaded... Now, this is somebody who has stopped weighing God's love on weak parameters. Now, he understands the basis of God's love. It's not about what happens for me or what doesn't happen for me. It's about that Jesus died for me. I am persuaded that neither death, no wonder some of them died believing this thing, nor life, 
nor angels. So if I wake up this morning and I see an angel by my bedside telling me, Oh, my son, God does not love you. He says that has nothing to do with anything. Neither principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, which I don't know, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able, oh my, to separate us from the love of God. And this love of God is in who? Christ Jesus. The love of God is not about experiences. What I have been through or what I have not been through. The love of God is about the person who he gave to die for us. So, whatever you are facing right now, don't, don't use it to estimate or weigh God's love for you. If you are going through hell or high water, God loves you. That's why his son died for you. Your experiences are not strong or big enough. Because there is nothing you would be going through right now that is as much as the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Next, God's love brings out the best in us. God's love brings out the best in us. So because he loves us, he walks with us through it all. Because he loves us, he walks with us stage by stage until we become what he's talking about. God's love brings out the best in us. Luke 7, verse 47. She loves much because she has been forgiven much. The woman caught in adultery is the woman being spoken about. After a while, she came with an alabaster box, and then she poured costly ointment on the feet of Jesus, using her hair to wipe his feet. And Jesus said she loves much because she has been forgiven much. The love that Jesus showed her has metamorphosed her into somebody else. God's love brings out the best in us. God's love does not give up on us. No matter who you are or what you are going through, he keeps walking with you until you become the finished product he's telling you about. Every true love will make you productive. Every true love will bring out the best in you. When he's bringing out the worst in you, no, that's not love. Love on God's standard will bring out the best in you. Praise God forevermore. And then lastly, God's love is fear free. God's love is fear free. God's love has no fear in it. God's love is fear free. First John 4, verse 17 to 18. First John 4, 17 to 18. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. 18. There is no fear in love. So fear and love are inversely proportional. The more one rises, the other go down. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. So when you are still living in fear, the love is not yet made perfect. That's why my pastor Bonosas preached that the fear of God is not the beginning of wisdom. Because you don't come to people you fear. You go away from them. But God wants you to come closer. And so fear cannot be the means by which he draws you nigh. He only draws you nigh by means of what? Love. Scripture says it is the goodness of God 
that brings men to repentance. Show me Romans 2, verse 4. It is not the love, it is not the fear of God that brings you close to God. No, it is the goodness of God. Yes, thank you. Not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. And that is why people cannot say they are genuinely saved if they come to God out of fear for hellfire. That is not a good relationship. So you do so much for God, but all that is at the back of your heart is a fear for hell. No, you are not made perfect in love. And, and, and relationships like that, I wonder what will happen the day an angel comes out through the sky, blows a trumpet, and shouts that all of this was a scam. We are just joking with you. There is no hell anywhere. You know, will you be in church the next Sunday morning? If actually there is nothing like that, all of this, you know, one day one of my daughters asked me, say, what if we realize at the end of the day that we are the ones who are wrong? She said, what if we realize that our own faith, we are the ones who are making a mistake? What if actually the Buddhists are the ones who are right? Or the, you know? <laughs> there is no fear in love. First John 4, 17. Start from verse 17. And, and see, it says, First John 4, 17. Go back there. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Heaven will open up to you as you approach boldly. So if you still have any trace of fear, chances are you are not going in that direction. It says, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? As he is. So are we in this world. If Jesus were to be on this earth, would Jesus live in fear of not going to heaven? You understand? As he is, so are we in this world. Next verse. There is no fear in love. Tell your neighbor, say, there is no fear in love. See, if you are scared of somebody, you need to think about it. <laughs> there is no fear in love, but a perfect love casts outward fear. Why? He explains to you, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear has torment. And that's why God is not one strict father who is looking out at his long whip, waiting to whip you on any little mistake you make. No, that's not God. There is no fear in love. You can't, you know, we try to live, we try to, how would I say it now? We try to relate to God as we relate to our elders. God is not an African. You don't, you don't come to God on the basis of culture. Somebody told me, why do guys wear cap in your church? Can they wear cap when they are talking to their fathers at home? I said, that is why God is not a Bini man. You don't relate with God on the basis of your culture. He is God of the whole world. What if there's another culture in which people wear cap to approach their own fathers? Will you say he's God of some and not God of the others? God is the God who, when you want to come to him, you come boldly. 
If he's wearing a white garment, you stain it and jump on him. He is father. You see the way children run all over this place and will close. That's how to relate with God. God, there are no heirs around him. There is no protocol. What you call protocol, really, is a fear. And that is because, like it is written, you have not been made what? Perfect in love. God is the guy you, he likes it bang into my bedroom without knocking. Jump on me. Romans 8, 15. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But we have received the spirit of what? Adoption. So when you believe in Christ Jesus, God adopts you as his child. Whereby now we can cry what? Father, Father. You know Abba means Father. When you call him Father, it means there is now a relationship. Father, Father. Jesus always called God Father. That's why they took up stones to stone him. Because in their mind, this big God, how can he be your father? When you read the book of Matthew, when Matthew will not write kingdom of God, he writes kingdom of heaven. You know, the name God is so hallowed to them that if you want to write the name God, they go wash their hand. Ablution, like some people still do. So they prefer using another word for God because God is God, you know. You can't just be calling his name anyhow like that. But they didn't know a path that Jesus knew. Jesus also knew that God is what? Father. We are not saying he's not as big as you are saying. He is even bigger than you are saying. But that big God is also our word. Talk to me. Father. And you must relate. See, if you want to relate with God as, you know, um, deity and it subjugates, you, you will miss out on a lot of things in the Christian work. You must relate to God as what? Father and children. God has love. The love of God. Think about the prodigal son. After this guy squandered all of his father's inheritance to him in riotous just living, when he came back home, his father even squandered more on him. When he came back home, we would think his father will be sitting at the door waiting and say, uh, hey, I told you, you should come back. Okay? When he came back home, the father gave him a signet, his ring. Say, go and, now that ring means go and buy whatever you want to buy. Or whatever you want, okay, with that symbol of authority is paid for. His father threw him a party. Who welcomes a son like that? This is a son who has wasted all you gave him. He came back, you wasted more wealth on him. If only the son knew that everything he was looking for outside, he could have it in his father's presence. If only he knew he would stay in his father's presence. You know, you know it was not the father that called that boy prodigal. The word prodigal means wasteful. Whoever wrote the book of Luke called him prodigal. It was the writer, okay? The father called him the lost son. He was lost. Now he has been found. You read that chapter, you will see the lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. That is the business of Jesus, always looking out for those who are lost. Why? Because all God has is what? Love. God's love does not fade. That's why he says, neither death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. As long as you are still here, he keeps on beckoning on you to come. All right? He pricks you in your heart. His love never gives up on you. His love always tries to bring out what? The best in you. That is the love of God, and that is what we receive to become children of God. For as many as have received him, to them he gave what? Power to become what? The sons of God. Have you received God's love today? Yes. When you receive God's love for you, what do you do? You respond to it. How do you respond to it? You love your fellow man. Praise God. And then you reach out for those who are lost. 
Every week I look for someone I will give a surprise call. Someone who is not expecting or someone I've not spoken to in a very long time. You are looking for avenues to love because she loves much because she has been what? Forgiven much. If God forgave you this much, you will love even much more. Praise God forevermore. So God's love is everlasting. God loves us equally but differently. God's love gives endlessly. God's love will always conquer any challenge. God's love brings out the best in you. And God's love is what? It's fear free. We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior.